Welcome to yet another edition of a lecture looking at uh, Mpagazi's calls for independence. I have titled today's lecture Mpagazi's calls for independence. Are they justified? As uh, we discovered in our previous uh, lecture that uh, we seem to have quite a number of reasons why people have been coming up with this idea that um, Tagazi must be an independent state, independent from Zimbabwe. So then we continue to deliberate on whether there are any justifications in, in, in these polls, as well as trying to understand the basis. You see, there is an English proverb which says you never see smoke without fire. What it basically means is when you hear people talk about a certain issue, you may not fully understand it yourself, but the fact that they keep talking about it on and on and on endlessly is a sign that maybe you need to give it attention. Maybe they have a point. Or maybe they are mistaken, and uh, you can only determine whether they are mistaken if you pay attention to them, hear their point of departure and their reasoning, then go on maybe to even identify their errors and be able to talk to them, to talk them out of those errors, if, if, if one could say. So I invite especially those who are skeptical of this whole idea, those who are outrightly critical of uh, these clamors from Tagazi independence to, to really pay attention to what I'm going to say and then be, from there we should be able to engage on whether there are any justifications uh, in these calls or there are no justifications at all. <clears throat> now uh, it is true that every one of us sees the world from their own perspective and from their own point of view. Uh, this idea of, you know, this issue of seeing things from different angles, depending on where we stand, is particularly magnified when one looks at the, the situation in Zimbabwe and the, the discussions around critical area, uh, uh, critical issues of importance. For instance, when the people of Mpagazi uh, say that they are being marginalized, we have one other section of the population which then turns around and says, no, you guys are crybabies, you are always crying. Um, somebody once said that uh, if your lips dry up, you should never blame the wind for drying up, especially if you have not been licking and moisturizing your lips with your own tongue and your own mouth. So they are saying, don't blame the wind for drying your lips if you are not actively moisturizing them. So for some people, this talk and this cry and this clamor uh, for independence based on perceived marginalization. Uh, it, it is actually, they say, uh, a, a fault of those who don't seem to have, uh, you know, risen to the occasion, uh, as some people want to put it. Now, you see, this subject of marginalization of non-Shona people in Zimbabwe has strained relations for a reasonably long period of time. One would say. For the past 41 day, 41 years, sorry, the relations have continued to be strained day by day, day. But I think now they are reaching a point where this outright call for independence is something that that is gaining a lot of uh, momentum. A lot of people are getting interested in it, and those who maybe are uh, going to be left in Zimbabwe if this is an eventual success. We have uh, different voices there. We have people concerned that uh, 
uh, this will jeopardize Zimbabwe in the viability of the state and so on. You even hear people who have never been to Matevele Land saying that, uh, you know, partitioning Zimbabwe from uh, the way it is now is going to disadvantage them. I, I don't even understand how that would happen because if you are staying, say, at Iwonde Valley, uh, how would uh, a redefining of Lupani as part of maybe, say, another state, how would that affect you? Because you are not staying in Lupani anyway. Unless you are suggesting that you would want to come all the way from Onde Valley, you could have come and take resources in Lupani, which on its own is a basis for a misunderstanding. But anyway, that's a subject for another day. So what I was saying now is people are calling for the formation of a separate state of Umpagazi or the Republic of Umpagazi. Some people would call it the Republic of Matevelele, whatever the name. I think those are issues that are not as significant as the, the, the outcome that is being sought. So some people call it secession, but the Umpagazi people themselves call it a program of independence. Because as far as they are concerned, they are pursuing a program of independence uh, uh, in terms of uh, this right to self-determination, which is enshrined in Article 1 as well as Article 55 of the United Nations Charter. This right to self-determination is actually an entrenched right. It's a very protected right. In fact, it, uh, it formed the basis for the decolonization not only of Africa but of all the countries that were still under colonization by around 1945 when the charter was drawn. So some people, like I have said, some people call it secession, but the Batwagazi themselves call it a, a right to independence, a fight for self-determination. Now there is a difference between secession and restoration Secession uh, means that uh, a state is being carved out of an existing uh, state to create another state. In other words, you are partitioning territory uh, that uh, already is part of a state, a fully fleshed state, and then you are creating a state outside that. So that is secession. But in the case of Matevele, it is arguably uh, a restoration because this state used to exist. Um, the British themselves in 1883 and 1894, when they fought and overcame uh, and the Ndebele state, or Umpagazi, as it is uh, affectionately called by some people. Uh, they knew that they were fighting and overcoming a sovereign state. Lopengula was a sovereign. If one looks at uh, the Privy Council uh, decision uh, concerning land rights, uh, in terms of that uh, <coughs> Privy Council decision of 1919, uh, the, the sovereignty of uh, the Ndebele state and the Ndebele king was not questioned. So, Lopengula was sovereign. It was a state which was overcome in 1894, particularly after a, a fight for a few months. So, this Mtwagas, therefore, is not being carved out of an existing state, but uh, these states were subjoined erroneously and by British colonial mischief, actually. So, you find that uh, Abetwagas are a distinct territory, they are a distinct population, they have uh, rights, rather they have, uh, yeah, you call them rights, but uh, most importantly, these people have some common aspirations, common dreams, they share a common past. For instance, all the areas in, 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 in the Twagas, all the communities, have been treated as foreigners by the government and by the people of Zimbabwe. They have endured a genocide. 
that is not been reconciled, that the people of the Lord were not interested in even looking into, let alone admitting that there was a genocide, which they themselves called Bukura Wundu in their own language. So, that on its own then presents an argument that uh, Mpagazi is different from Zimbabwe. That then brings me to say, while Zimbabwe needs and requires political reforms in order to gain stability, um, Pagazi, on the other hand, requires independence from Zimbabwe. It sounds controversial, but if you sit with me long enough, Kizu, you will be able to understand the logic behind this statement and this proposition. We are saying, while Zimbabwe presents a position of a core, uh, you see, it's a core in that it is holding on to all the strings and the levers of power. It's calling the shots. The rest of, uh, especially Matebeleleng, the communities there are at the periphery. They don't decide what's happening. This it just resembles what used to happen during the days of colonialism whereby London presented the core whilst uh, the colonies were at the periphery. So what we currently have is uh, Harare has replaced London, where London or Berlin or Brussels or Madrid or Lisbon or, or you know, Paris, whilst those used to be the core for the colonial uh, or the imperial states, Harare has become the new metropole, the new core, whilst the rest of the places like Blumpty, places like Nkai, places like Zuzani, uh, Baybridge, or you're talking about the, the Jambezi, or you're talking about Siapua, uh, Ubimbi, all those places. Uh, we talk about Ngamu, safaris and so on, all those places have become, in fact they are the periphery, resources are being drawn from them, they are being drawn into Harare which is the metropole, to develop and to benefit the people at the metropole, while the people who, are, who reside in the areas that provide the resources live in abject poverty. So we have now a, a community, uh, the community of Mpagazi coming to realize that uh, for 41 years it has been treated, they have been treated as outsiders in that territory where they stay. Hence, they are demanding independence. And what is particularly disturbing is that uh, Zimbabwe's legal framework itself has provided a fertile ground for the propagation and development of these uh, separatist, uh, you know, ideas and the, the, separatist, the separatist agenda, if one could put it that way. Because we have a legal system that has provided an opportunity uh, particularly when it comes to the implementation of the law itself, it has provided an opportunity for an exploitation of the periphery by the core, and particularly by those who are closest to the core. So, as a result, Zimbabwe has become a very unequal society where we have full citizens and half citizens. The full citizens obviously are of Shona speaking uh, stock, whilst the, the periphery is constituted by all these other ethnic groups who are outside the, the Shona grouping. Then they are just assimilated uh, uh, to the main at the invitation of the full citizens. So that's why you find only a few of those who would go in there, those from the Venga, the Tonga, the Mbelele, the Kalanga, or the Supu. They are there, but at the invitation of those who happen to sit at the higher table. So, 
and the rest of the people therefore just have to pick up crumbs that are falling you know the proverbial crumbs that jesus spoke about falling from the master's table that's what is happening at the periphery so the half citizens cry out all the time but the full citizens think that the cries are lame excuses now why do they why does the periphery continue to cry and uh, those at the metropole do not seem to understand or to identify with the cries why is it impossible for the cries of the people in Lugane or in Lampi, Brunapet, why is it impossible for their cries to resonate with the people in Kutumbandawana or a place like in Dusarabane or whatever? Why is it so different? Why is it so, so impossible? Now, as I have already said, the legal and the political frameworks have proffered advantages to the full, cities, uh, full citizens which the half citizens do not enjoy. So just as in the previous racially dominated or skewed systems where whites enjoy the privileged positions, the current system favors everybody who speaks Shona and has a Shona name. So under the white system, you remember that uh, the whites always argued that they were rich because they were hard workers. Even today, when the issue of uneven distribution of wealth and resources is being discussed, uh, you often hear people say, the Ndebele people are not hardworking. As a result, they are always grumbling and complaining. I think this echoes exactly what uh, a white boy or white girl would have, have said in 1976 on being confronted on why he owned the farm, for instance, he would have said, I have worked hard to earn the farm. So a black person who doesn't have a farm, uh, he does not have it just because he has not worked as hard as I have. Now this whole myth about uh, how hard work will yield uh, wealth and riches is actually a distortion of the truth. Because I'm not sure if uh, the Rockefellers uh, would have the Rockefellers, I mean, the, the founders, the owners of the Rockefeller Foundation, whether the Rockefellers have worked harder than everybody else, I'm not sure. But anyway, that's a discussion for another day. So because the current system favors people of Shona-speaking, uh, I mean, Shona-speaking people, it, it always difficult now for the non-Shona-speaking people to discuss openly with the, their, their other out, uh, counterparts because we have those that do not believe uh, that uh, those who have earned whatever they have is, is, is through hard work. Um, those are some of the issues that really become critical in this whole discussion. Now you will understand that 41 years of enabling might have blinded the beneficiary from the realities on the ground. I mean, if you for 41 years you have been a beneficiary of a system where your name, just your name, uh, our courts use some privileges, then you will not understand those people who are not uh, exactly in that privileged position. For instance, I know of people, I've heard of people who travel the whole way from Gwanda or from Majambu in Plumpton go and attend a t an interview, say, at the teacher's college or whatever technical college in, in Ndare or in Bindura, only to get there. Having traveled for days and days, you get there, you sit down before the panel, and the first thing that they do is they greet you in Shona. And the whole the interview is conducted in Shona. So the moment the interview starts, you are disadvantaged a single word right up to the end of the interview and by the time you walk out you know you have failed already and meanwhile you have spent that hard earned cash just to go and attend that interview so we, we are talking about a scenario here where because of an advantage that some people have had they become insensitive 
to the cries of those who have not had the same privileges. As a result, it strains the relationship. But uh, some, but some people may say that what I'm saying here is far-fetched because uh, it's speculative. There's no such things. There's no evidence, whatever. Um, but now let us look at this. There are quite a number of, you know, points that I want to to take a note of in explaining what I just said. Number one, it is not a lie. That the directors of government departments are appointed by the, uh, by the government, and they are mostly identified, or rather, they are mostly uh, appointed from among the Shona-speaking people, because they are the ones at the top in Zanu-PF, and they have always been in Zanu-PF after all. And secondly, it is not a lie that business licenses are issued by the government through government departments. So directors are Shona speaking people appointed to issue business licenses and they mostly issue those licenses from the headquarters in Harare. And then the monitoring and the enforcement of the law, the rules, the regulations governing daily lives of the as well as governing uh, business generally, they are carried out by a police force that is predominantly shown as speaking. And then you find that local government personnel in every part of the country are appointed by the central government and they are also not speaking. They are of Shona stock. All of them. You see, people must not be account I mean, uncomfortable with uh, citing issues. Uh, students of uh, immunology, that is, those that deal with casting out demons, will know that uh, even in the biblical sense, you can't cast out a demon until you identify it and address it by name. So basically, if uh, people are grumbling about the privileges given to the Shona people. The Shona people must not feel uncomfortable with that. In fact, that's an opportunity for them to do self um, introspection, analyze the whole thing, find if there is any merit in these accusations, and then talk openly and address them if there is anything to be addressed. Instead of people getting very emotional when this uh, matters are raised. Let's discuss them openly. Is it true that directors of companies, uh, in fact, directors of departments are Shona, that licenses are issued in Harare by Shona speaking people, that local government uh, officials, the district administrator, and so on, who are involved in allocating land in the, in the villages, in the districts, they are of Shona, I mean, they are Shona speaking, and is it a lie? that the government used the law after Gugura win to ring fence itself, deny uh, the protection of the law to the victims of Gugura win and uh, amend the law in such a way that uh, it became difficult to prosecute uh, those that were directly involved in the abuse of, 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 of the people's rights. So the government assumed the responsibility over the perpetrators of Gugura Wundi and then it amended the laws and adopted the laws that were meant to silence those who may have had any, you know, desires to pursue these uh, abuses before the court. So these are some of uh, the issues that uh, lie at the core and at the center of this ongoing debate. Now. We are now going to look at how these uh, realities affect the people of Mutara. For instance, how are they affected by the fact that uh, the directors are Shona speaking and they are in Harare? How are they affected by the fact that uh, business licenses are issued in Harare? 
How are they affected by the presence of Shona police everywhere in the country? How about the issue of local government and so on? So these are issues that we really need to confront head on and discuss openly. Right. Uh, first and foremost, it is very clear that uh, we have a system that has enabled the Shona people to acquire resources, to establish businesses which the rest of the communities are not able to do. I will call this a resource privilege. And by a resource privilege, I mean the ability to demand resources at will from those that are under you or below your position. This is done through soliciting bribes from those seeking national services such as applying for a, a birth certificate, a passport, a death certificate. Because you find that uh, in order to apply for a passport or these other documents, one has to pay. It is a, in a, course, it is a very corrupt system. And in a corrupt system like uh, the ZANU-PF system, rights such as passports, birth certificates, death certificates have been commodified. They have been turned into commodities. They have become tradables. Just like you walk into a shop and buy a pair of shoes or a loaf of bread, uh, it has now become imperative to buy a birth certificate if you need one. Now, it is unfortunate that only those who can access the directors and the senior home affairs officials are able to get these essential documents. Now, thinking particularly about the people of Matsebuleleng, who, on realizing that they did not have a government, then decided to live their lives outside Zimbabwe by going to South Africa and so on. Once it becomes difficult to acquire a passport, then life comes to a standstill because their lives depend on that passport. So, the fact that corruption is not an official way of doing business means that the further away you are from the directors, the less likely you, are, you will be in terms of accessing these rights. Now, you find that because Shona language is the medium or the language of the transactions, if you don't know how to speak that language, you can't even bribe anyone. They can't even trust you. And you can't even articulate what you are trying to say. So it has become very difficult for these non shona speaking people to access services in a country that has always kept them at the periphery and prevented them from coming into the mainstream of society. So the other problem is that uh, a person not proficient in the language therefore can't be trusted in is an outsider. I think I've already uh, mentioned that part. And then directors of departments, that is directors of all these government departments, who are appointed from one ethnic group, have therefore acquired a resource privilege. So just by being appointed to a position, one gets entitled to the ability to make money. Because you know, a passport is a tradable. Anybody who wants a passport must come and pay to get a passport. So a Tonga, a vendor, a Kalanga, a Nambia uh, is a person who is a customer all the time. And within that network, there are so many numerous, uh, there are so many middlemen, middle persons that you have to pay along the way. Which means if you are at the extreme end of the spectrum, you've got to pay even more. Because every one of those middle persons requires the oiling of their hands. So you find then that those who are closer to the core, even though there is corruption, they are affected uh, less adversely than those at the extreme end of the periphery, or, I mean, of, yes, of the periphery end of the spectrum. Um, because each person 
in the in the chain demands some spoils. Now you can imagine how difficult it is to be on the lowest rank in this network of corruption. You pay an arm and a leg. So that's the issue of you know not having directors uh, there, all directors speaking one language means you will always have to pay in order to do what you require. Now the other issue is the uh, issue of business licenses. Um, you find that uh, you know in terms of the law generally the government is entitled to exercising two kinds of power. We have what is called uh, the police powers of the state or the regulatory powers when it comes to regulating business. And then we have uh, what is called eminent domain. Now I'm going to try and unpack what I mean by the police powers and the eminent domain. You see, the regulatory powers of the state, which are also called the police powers of the state, have got to do with uh, issues such as granting licenses for businesses. If you want to operate a business, uh, you must be granted a, a license because the state or the government is the one that uh, regulates and moderates what takes place within the business environment so as to protect consumers among other uh, problem factors and just to ensure that there is sanity within any sector of the economy so that's the regulatory power for instance if you if you if you own a bus you can't just uh, drive your bus and start carrying people you need a driver's license and you will also need a permit which is a, a license to drive that bus in a specific route to carry a specific number of people at specific times so it is this issuing of business licenses by the state or by government which is referred to as uh, the, the exercise of uh, police or regulatory powers of the state then there is what is called the power of eminent domain, whereby by virtue of its authority, the state can designate or can compulsorily acquire your property. In other words, if you are occupying, for instance, communal land, the state can just take that land anytime, and then you will be told to move to another place. And maybe because the Chinese have been allocated some mining rights there by your place. Like recently happened in debt, people are just being moved at WeWat without consultation. So those are the, pow the, 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 the powers of eminent domain. Now, you look at how this government of Zanupir has been exercising these political, I mean, these powers uh, against the people of Matelele. Oh, it's obviously not been the same as it has been doing in Mashona. For instance, uh, we have said that uh, regulatory power means the capacity to change and implement regulations in terms of which business and property rights are implemented. I gave an, a, an example of a bus. Recently, a, a statutory instrument was issued out in terms whereof um, Owners or operators of minibuses are all expected to affiliate to a government consortium called Zoop. Now, in order to con to affiliate, your your vehicle and your business must be vetted. Now, remember, these are businesses that have been operating for a long time in Bulawayo, in Gwanda, and everywhere. All of a sudden. You must now take your bus, your minibus, and be vetted and be issued with an operational license to now join that Zupco consortium. It is a long term. If you are not 
of the Shona was Doka. You are not assured of a route. You are not assured of a license. So as a result, we have many bus operators um, coming all the way from Harare to come and to apply routes in Bulawayo. So they bring in their conductor, they bring in their driver, who is going to be carrying people from Pumula to Makokoba, uh, speaking in Shona to them. And you expect them not to feel colonized. <laughs> That's expecting too much from the people. Now, so, so if you own a bus, you can't just operate it without a license. You have to apply for the license. And the law regulates the circumstances in which you operate. And the worst of part, as we have said, is that you are not assured of getting the license when you apply for it. Um, you see, and the fact that you've got to go to, to, to Harare to apply there for some of your visa licenses makes the whole thing very difficult. Um, and in most of the cases, licenses are denied and given to people from outside my, 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 my land. It's a competition for people. They are scarce resources. The, the government of Zimbabwe and the people of Zimbabwe don't believe in a free market. They believe in a restricted market whereby only those connected to the state must be able to run business. So you can imagine what happens if you are not close to Zanu here. You will never ever get that license. Now, meanwhile, because Shona speaking people don't go through the same hurdles and hardships to obtain licenses. When they do obtain those licenses and come to Bulawayo or Matsalani, they then go on to say, ah, you guys are lazy. You do not want to work. You are not business-minded. Meanwhile, they can't appreciate all this bureaucratic red tape that you've been going through, the frustration that you've been going through, which is systematic, by the way. It's not accidental. It's something that has been designed to function like that, so as to frustrate the people of Matsalanian and push them first out of business and secondly out of the country so that they can go to South Africa and elsewhere. So you can imagine all this insensitivity that comes uh, through the lips of recipients of the licenses who do not understand what goes on behind the scenes and they tend to post that uh, they are running businesses because they are more innovative and they are more industrious. And that's been going on for 41 years. And certainly this creates this unequal society for the privileged and the underprivileged who happen to be excluded. And it becomes difficult to, for the two persons to view things from the same corner. Without a business license, you cannot run a business. And yet you cannot obtain a business unless you, if you belong to a certain tribe. So what do you end up doing? You end up packing your bus, whatever. Uh, business, whatever capital goods you have, you, you can't use them because you don't have that privilege to obtain the rights and the permits to do so. Thirdly, we have the issue of the implementing of the implementation of the rules and the regulations by officers, whether police officers or judicial officers, everybody is from Marshall. Even when you go before a magistrate's court, you don't exactly know whether uh, the, the verdict that is going to come out is going to be a fair one or it's got to do with uh, your own uh, identity as a person and uh, your ethnic background. So everything is done through this uh, Shona, predominantly Shona uh, structures by people who speak Shona and you feel like an outsider. Can you imagine driving around Bulawayo? Uh, the only thing you encounter is a, 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 a Shona policeman with a roadblock. And the, 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 the greeting there is Shona. Uh, the request for a driver's license is made in Shona. Uh, whether they are asking about your headlights or your braking system, your handbrake, and all, it's all conducted. So that on its own really presents an image of a colonized community. Um, the 
again, now I understand people may have been abused by Shona speaking in Kukura only, uh, that army. They feel justified to logically assume that the system is primarily designed to silence them. Now, local government structures, as we have said, are populated with personnel from Ashona land just as it was the case under colonization. So land and mining rights are allocated to people from Ashona land, even though there are people locally who have been applied for those uh, land rights. They can't be given mining rights, they can't be given you know, land on which to till and to plow and to provide for their own livelihood. Um, so, so this this magnifies this image of a, a native colonization whereby the Shona speaking people seem to be at the helm and the rest of the people are at the periphery and outside the structure. So what has actually happened is that uh, the ZANU system has done away with the book register. Remember they used to be Isokubu whereby the names of all the people in that village were registered and the land under which uh, the, the land which fall and uh, fell under a, a certain uh, subgroup's authority was reserved only for those people whose names were in that register kept by that subgroup but uh, the current system has done away with the subgroup concept now anybody from as far afield as wherever can be allocated land rights to the exclusion of the local people. And that on, on is a continuation of colonization if one does not get to accept it that way. So the elimination of the book system has uh, opened Mtara's land to people from outside and other districts. And then this is even exacerbated by the fact that the district administrators themselves who happen to allocate resources are from outside the region and uh, what answer is given when you confront the, the, the authority to say but why do we have a, a district administrator here who comes from outside you get the answer that you people here are not educated and then you wonder what it means to be educated according to Zimbabwean standards because it seems like the level of education required of people in my colonial differs from that of the people required in Mashona Land. Because even when they have the same qualifications, or even higher qualifications, you always get the impression that they are not educated. So those are, that's the rhetoric that is employed to justify the plunder of resources, the exclusion of the people. And I'm saying, the issues that have just been discussed, uh, you know, fit into this idea of a two-state scenario uh, whereby a cordial partnership seems impossible because we have one group that seems to be enjoying and we have another group that seems not to have any rights at all. So you see Zimbabwe's system has, uh, has created a scenario whereby we have two groups behaves those who have everything at their disposal they have access to business licenses uh, even when there are regulatory uh, you know supervisors coming around they are assured that their own businesses will continue meanwhile the rest of the other people those from the other end of, of the same uh, political or uh, country or t uh, polity they are excluded. So we have those who have and those we have those who don't have. And this is a dangerous scenario. It is a very dangerous scenario because it presents us with a situation whereby those who do not have anything will not lose anything even if anything were to happen. So once we have a group of people who have nothing to lose, then we have sown seeds for caps. People of people who are non-shona speaking, 
have been dispossessed of everything, uh, their rights in the village or in the city, even their rights to acquire anything or even to go out of the country. They have been stripped of all those rights and privileges. They are cornered. It's, they, they are treated like animals instead of people. So, because now we have a scenario where these people have nothing to lose besides the chains of slavery and bondage that keep them down, then we have a, 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 we have a scenario where a confrontation is imminent. So coupled with the 41 years of neglect by a ZANU PF government, the idea of an independent Zagaz has crystallized into the most sought after solution. Um, you see, we have the go around the system of a continuing genocide, systematic exclusion, and partisan conferment of rights and privileges, which has cre created this fertile ground for a germination and growth of a Mpaga's nationhood. Uh, through it, pro-independent groups have galvanized support for a vision that has grown through leaps and bounds in the last two decades, uh, I should say. So, the, unw the unwillingness of the non abatwagas Zimbabweans to openly discuss these issues can only fuel the idea. Uh, they can only fuel the idea of separation further beyond a point of no return. It's a question of time when this point of no return is going to be reached. Because you see, human beings don't give up. Uh, I, I think one thing that uh, victors tend to overlook sometimes is that they continue to celebrate the victory for a long time and continue to press down their uh, victims hoping that uh, in fact enjoying that but it gets to a point where when a person gets cornered they then turn and face the enemy uh, readying themselves for whatever outcome uh, a dialogue on these issues would require the commitment of Zimbabwe, the commitment of the SADC, the African Union, the global community at large. Um, there is need for proactivity uh, in order to resolve these issues of empowers and materialism. I repeat, all the people involved need to act proactively and this is the time and we must act while time is still in our favor because we are talking about the people who have been subject to a state-sponsored genocide which the whole world has conveniently uh, looked away from pretended that people were not killed in we are dealing with a state which has ring fenced itself, protected itself, adopted laws that make it difficult to seek any legal redress within the borders and the boundaries of Zimbabwe. And coupled with the fact that the international community conveniently looks away, this is a recipe really for disaster. Because a people who don't have a government to cry unto will one day find a way of releasing that energy in a way that may not be good for everybody or for any particular nation. So the international community needs to heed this call for material and if they come in and meet yet and find out what the problem is, see if there could be a way of averting this out this demand. In the absence of that, the postponement of, of the issue could only result 
in more projects. Um, I know everyone is entitled to their own views about these issues, but in my closing remarks, I, I would ask a question and say, what are your own views about these things? Just feel free to discuss them openly. Uh, you can press you can respond by the on the comment below or you can even write to me an email uh, we can get to discuss these things please don't forget to press that subscribe button and like the video so that i can continue to give you some more thank you very much enjoy the rest of your day